you just mentioned off camera that you love throwing those overhands. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I do no, love them, but I don't, no, no. I don't think they're smart to do. Yeah. Now tell, talk, talk about, I guess, the, what we see versus how you train, because you kind of said like they're not cool. the same. So back home, I was notoriously known for throwing the big overhand. I had a few knockouts with them, but it's just not like the most technical professional strike, you know, when it's not meant to be used. So in training, I have beautiful straight right hands. When I switch, beautiful straight lefts. But man, when you have the four ounce glove on and then you see the guy, just that big bomb of a punch is, is what feels right. And I didn't practice them, but I threw them a lot. And, uh, and man, this one was hard. He was moving back the whole fight. And it was, it was hard to finish. It was hard to land flush when they're moving back so much. And then at the end of the first round, they were booing, and that broke my heart. So uh, my game plan was to, to out kickbox, and we had so many high kicks and low kicks planned. But man, in the fight, it's such a vivid reminder uh, how hard it can be to, to huck these kicks and actually hit them in the head without gassing or slipping or getting countered. So I just went back to some punches, and that's what worked. And, uh, and then I felt in the second round his, his gas tank gave a little. Did I could fight all day, I'll fight to death. That'd be awesome. And uh, so I ended up really pushing the pace and, and beating him there. So you said the crowd kind of motivated you to, to keep going. How does that affect you when you hear that? Man, I, I just, uh, the music I listen to, a band called Omar Monomartha, they sing about like the, the lifestyle of Vikings and, you know, like like fighting to a glorious death. And, uh, and back in the George St. Pierre era of UFC, they were looking for the world's best fighters and they had found them. But now all of the world's best fighters are here and the belts get handed off so I don't have like championship aspirations or, or ranking aspirations. I want to be known as a guy who like goes to war and like has epic fights and crazy knockouts no one's seen before. And, uh, and when the fight was at that pace that just wasn't going to happen and, uh, and it really made me sad and made me, made me push the pace. But there was some blood in the second and third round so that was cool. Yeah, so uh, if you guys, you know, if you've never, if you've ever blocked a kick wrong, you know, you've broke forearms. I had a kickboxing match in, for Legacy in 2015, broke a guy's arm in half with the kick, so blocking him properly is really important. And even with proper blocks, which I did, just that, that shin cracks your elbow. And I think I blocked like eight or nine of them, and my elbow's just sore. It's a fight, it's gonna happen. I need some ice, but I'll ice it up later. Good God. He was hard to put away, but again, when guys are moving back, uh, it's, it can be hard to finish, and he's known for like, I punch, he steps back, and he steps back in for the counter, and I didn't want to get countered. I know he hit me twice, but, uh, but I, I remember walking through him, they hit me, but they, they, didn't, they didn't do much damage. But I just didn't want to get hit with anything stupid, especially at the end of the round. And man, in the third, I felt like I could have finished him, but, uh, but man, I, I just tried and, and didn't get that finish. But he was super tough, super nice guy, uh, and, uh, and man, I wanted to beat him at his own game, but that's just hard to do. Were you aware that he, uh, he was the last guy to make weight? Yeah, man. Yeah, in the in the sauna, I, he asked for a catch weight, and I was like, absolutely not. You know, mm -hmm. it's not what we do. You know, I, I can I make weight easy too. You know, I know I've been doing this for a long time. There's no way I'll ever bust weight or ask for a catch a day of. And I saw he was struggling, but I knew he'd come strong fight night. He's down to scrap. He asked you in the sauna, to, hey, do you want to do this? Yeah, 173, and I was like, no way, absolutely not. There's no way. <laughs> like, how do you explain that to UFC boss? Plus, I can make weight. It wasn't even wasn't even an option. How much? So you kind of knew right then. Kind of had an advantage. Uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe he was breakable, but man, it's those little things. You know, they they don't mean that much in a fight. You know, you'll really know fight time. What's up? So. How much weight do you cut? Are you, cause you, you don't seem like a big welterweight. I'm not a big welterweight. So uh, morning of, I woke up at 178, so I had to sweat seven pounds out. And I'm a gross sweaty person, so I sweated <laughs> out in about 50 minutes in the sauna. It was done. Felt great. Weighed in. Yeah, making 55 is too hard. It's too much. If there was a weight class for 65, that'd be perfect. But uh, but honestly, like uh, Noak, probably the biggest welterweight out there. Those big dudes, they're slow. And uh, and if I, I didn't get hit by him much in that fight, so so yeah, I don't mind being the smaller, quicker fighter. Plus, making weight's easy. There's some guys have like a weird idea to be the biggest you can possibly be, cut so much weight, and then they don't perform very well. Yeah, I, I, I guess you're you're a big believer in that. You need to fight. I guess closer to your walking weight, this big, these big weight cuts that just yeah. don't work anymore. And I'm just a dense person, man. I walk around around 185, and I know I'm not the leanest guy in the world, but, but when I was younger, I was a fat kid, lost a bunch of weight training, fell in love with the martial arts, and started fighting ever since so I can, I can hold weight really easy. So it's just something I've dealt with, but I've had a lot of success. I fought some big jacked guys and knocked them out, and so it doesn't matter. Got any uh, beefs with anybody you want to settle? Any, any, <laughs> no, any man, fighting in the UFC is the coolest thing ever so anyone uh, the guy who just fought Kyle Noak uh, Omari Akhmedov I believe his name uh, I thought that I, we had good matches I would like to do that fight he's a big strong scary guy too I think that'd be a cool one to fight but but really anyone man I uh, again I'm not looking to climb up the rankings super fast like some guys are I want to be like a like a veteran in the UFC I want to have 20 fights by the time I retire so I'm not looking to to chase gold or do anything crazy I want to be a 
a comfortable employee for the UFC. Love the company. And then jumping forward a couple of weeks, uh, who do you got in the um, UFC 207 headliner between Rousey and Nunez and why? Uh, so the Rousey and John Jones fall in a similar boat. Amazing martial artists have immense respect for their skill set. But socially, when you're a champion like that, I believe you have an obligation and a duty to be a good role model uh, for those who can't be in the spotlight. And, and they're not, uh, especially Rousey. I, I am not a fan of her attitude or like her mannerisms. Uh, so I'm really rooting for, for uh, Nunez. I think she'll win too. So yeah, I, I believe you know, people have a responsibility to be a good role model. And with all that power, they don't do it. It's, it's just not good for our society. Yeah. Hey, thanks a lot, guys. It was awesome. For sure. Hey, thanks, man. Go ice my elbow. Thank you so much.